us to do a much more kind of global overview mm -hmm. of the politics of claims making by women workers. And in doing that, uh, I was also asked to address the sort of broad framework that this project was working with. Uh, but I found myself, again, like the others, moving a little away from Hatun and uh, Weldon, much more towards Nancy Fraser's re uh, redistribution, recognition, and representation, much more to Keck and Sicking, who talk about the kind of repertoire of tactics used by transnational movements, but which are also applicable at the local level. And these, are, these tactics include uh, the politics of information, how you use, you know, sort of plausible facts to make your case, how you use discourses, um, how you use uh, uh, leverage and accountability. So what we're talking about are uh, strategies that are adopted by people, uh, workers, who do not have the kind of structural position that the old trade unions used to occupy and that they could use to, to promote their cause. We are talking about largely women workers um, in uh, fairly uh, you know, vulnerable jobs, very often not organized. Um, in doing this global overview, I found myself uh, categorizing uh, women workers into three separate groups uh, based on their relationship to the global economy. So the first group were workers who are in the global value chains and who are working in you know, labor-intensive export, agriculture, and manufacturing, and so on. And they are clearly globalized. The second group are migrant workers, also clearly globalized, because as someone said this morning, you need cooperation between different kinds of countries to address their claims. The third group of workers into which a lot of the domestic workers fall are workers for the, working for the domestic markets who are not uh, involved directly in globalization. But because globalization has become such a part of our lives, even for these nationally based uh, workers, we find the global story is a part of their strategies. One of the missing uh, dimensions in Keck and Sicking, because they're talking about transnational activists, is actually a prior process of organization building. So while they talk about what people do once they are an organization, once they're mobilized, they do not talk about what it takes to mobilize vulnerable workers. And when we talk in particular about informal economy workers, we find that the politics of organization building is a, a prior to all the others. So to cut a very long story short, 33,000 words, um, the workers in global value chains, we find that they are largely represented by what has come to be known as the anti-sweatshop movement. So you have um, you know, largely northern-based tr trade unions, often working with southern unions, uh, consumer groups, church groups, student activists, and so on. Uh, chasing their own multinationals, chasing their own corporations to make them accountable for the labor standards of the workers that they are employing in very distant lands and using very imaginatively and very humorously the same advertising, the power of advertising that these companies used to create their own brands. And you're all familiar with that and I, I won't really go into that very much. Except to say that in that process, there is a criticism that they often bypass local movements or local organization building. It's when we talk, turn to workers in the domestic economy, working for domestic markets, that we find there is a huge stress, as I said, on building organizations. So if you like, if we look at the kind of strategies used by these national-based workers, uh, the politics of organization building is the first. And that very often starts with what kind of organization do you want to be? Many will choose to be trade unions, even if they have been neglected by the trade unions, because the language of unionism is the language of workers. And these are workers who have long been denied recognition as workers. So domestic workers, sex workers, waste pickers, all these people who are seen as scavengers or you know, something fairly derogatory, need, you know, part of the process of organization building is becoming a union. But not everybody wants to become a union. There are organizations who want to stay as associations, a much looser framework, and one that has certain kinds of advantages. In rural areas in India, they might want to go for community-based organizations, or NGOs, and so on. So you get a range of different kinds of labor-oriented organizations, 
where the choice of organizational form reflects what you think is possible, feasible, and strategic in a particular context. Then when we go back to Keck and Sicken's uh, information, the politics of information, I think I've divided it into the internal politics of information and the external politics of information. The internal politics of information is about building identity. It's about getting people to recognize exactly how much they're contributing to the economy. So the waste pickers in, in Pune worked with the ILO to, to, to come up with an estimate of what they were contributing through their recycling efforts to the GNP of the city, not the GNP, the city MP, city national product. <laughs> um, so the politics of information is, part of it is about training people, training workers to acknowledge their rights, know about their rights. Uh, and I thought one very funny thing is about the organization working in Pune who uh, found, you know, these are women doing waste speaking on the streets who have been fending for themselves for a very long time. And the idea of sitting in a classroom, being trained, however participatory, participatory the training was, didn't suit their temperaments. So basically they learned to go for an on-the-job training. So if a woman was accused of theft, as uh, waste pickers and domestic servants often are, her colleagues would all go with her to the police station and learn how to, you know, defend themselves or lodge a complaint and so on. So they learned about their rights through, through doing, through a doing process. And then, of course, there's an external politics of information, which is about letting people know what conditions are, what, you know, what kind of wages, um, what employers are doing and so on, and trying to build a support, a support base. The other um, interesting kind of strategies that come out with these national-based uh, um, organizations is the extent to which, if you think of the uh, anti-sweatshop movement, it is very much addressed to corporations, transnational corporations, even if they might operate through the State Department or the Trade Department. Or whatever. But the target is you know, our corporations who are misbehaving elsewhere. The national-based organization addressed the state. The state at the national, state local, state municipal, etc. But their first port of call is the state. And to some extent, and I think this is the point made by Visha uh, and 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 about um, how do you set a minimum wage? When you know that your employer very often <laughs> may not be able to afford the minimum wage. So, you may have a minimum wage, but you use it as a bargaining tool. Mm -hmm. So there's a great deal of strategizing about mobilizing the, the power of the state at local and national level in a way that we don't really see in the anti sweatshop movement. The other very important uh, weapon, if you like, one of the weapons as you get organized, is the law. All countries have laws. All countries have labor laws, but they go unimplemented. But if you have organizations that are willing to stand by workers and take employers to court and use the law, or even threaten to use the law, that can be an unexpectedly powerful weapon. And so we find, whether it's migrant workers in Thailand or um, you know, um, garment workers in Bangladesh, etc., learning that the law is not always against them that the law can sometimes act in their favor. So, and actually pressing that law and making it work is one of the ways that you start to strengthen that law and make it a bit fairer. So these are, to some extent, what might, one might call the resources of soft power. It doesn't involve the kind of confrontational politics, it doesn't involve the strikes, the closed shops that were possible for the old trade union movement. It does involve persuasion, moral appeal, um, you know, appeals to justice, collective, uh, you know, symbolic politics, and so on. So, um, I want to, and then when we go to the migrant workers, we find, again, a very different story. Because here we have a group of workers who fall between two sets of jurisdictions, two forms of citizenship, and nobody wants to take responsibility. And what is very clear in reading, and I have to say, this was the, the literature I found hardest to um, pull out from because it is so diverse. But the couple of things that come up very strongly in that literature about claims making is how important the local political context is. So if you take a, a, a place like Singapore, which is, or is, was more repressive, 
the kind of politics you see around migrant workers is tends to be much more welfareist. Uh, you know, let's give them dignity, let's, let's, let's be nice to them, let's not abuse them. Where you have a broader democratic space for civil society, the, the, the claims making goes on towards rights. And it becomes a much more a global story. And what is very, I think, heartening are the two uh, countries, city-states that stand out in this literature in Asia. Hong Kong as a receiving country, which actually has, I think, one of the most liberal and the most progressive spaces for um, migrant workers to organize, and Philippines as a sending country, which also has one of the most uh, well-organized, and workers who are willing to take on the issues of migrants from around the world. So the Philippines, I think, has really led on the migrant worker struggles in a very political, progressive, and global way. So to, to, to conclude, I just want to draw out some, some sort of basic points that I think came out of this. Uh, the other point, of course, is these national-based organizations don't stay national. And I think StreetNet, HomeNet, WeGo, all of these are examples of membership-based organizations coming together, not looking necessarily like the old trade unions, but nevertheless um, having claims to actually be legitimate representatives of their members. So final points, I think, one is, of course, your structural location clearly shapes your politics, shapes the kind of organizations you are, shapes who will be speaking for whom, with whom, on behalf of whom. And we see the difference between the anti-sweatshop movement and the local workers' movements. Um, secondly, while they, sh they seem to share many uh, interests in common and, you know, working conditions or, and so on, there are certain important differences between these different groups. So if you like, the anti-sweatshop movement is very, very influenced by the ILO basic the core labor standards. That is central to CSR, central to a lot of their demands. When we look at the national-based workers, it isn't the ILO that they look towards so much. It is their own governments and their own legislation. It isn't so much about the right to work, um, sorry, about the right to organize, which is often suspended in the global value chains, but not suspended for these unimportant workers. So their battle is not for the right to organize, for the right to work and for rights at work. And a lot of it, because it's, it's uh, addressed to the state, takes the form of demands for various forms of social protection. You know, pensions, welfare for their children, minimum wage, and so on. And to some extent, I see that as a precursor to becoming more political about demands around um, wages and working conditions. And just as the, the transnational corporations are much more willing to observe health and safety standards, certain kinds of uh, labor rights, but not others like the right to association. So too, I think the Indian government, for instance, is more willing to recognize social protection demands yeah. than eliminating exploitative practices. So there's a quite a, a selective uh, observance, but ne nevertheless, the you know, struggle goes on. Um, the third point is the point I made earlier, how important political context is. It is not surprising that India, with its uh, a relatively unblemished record of democracy <laughs> has some of the most vibrant and um, you know active uh, labor organizations in civil society, and it is not surprising that, for instance, Egypt, etc., have found it quite difficult to go outside state-managed unions. The fourth point is the role of the state that we assume that because of globalization that the state has been weakened, but in fact, in many local contexts, we find that the state not only is the only <coughs> institution that will respond, <coughs> but is willing to respond, primarily because of democratic, sorry, <coughs> choked, um, democratic accountability. And then my final point is about uh, strong states require effective citizens. And that, and here I would take issue with the anti-sweatshop movement, that in, in acting on behalf of of, of global value chain workers, <coughs> they often neglected those in the hidden side of the value chain. Mm -hmm. So it's the first year workers who got their attention. Where I think the priority should be is to build local capacity. It's not easy, but there is no substitute, I think, and uh, Gail, Gail Seidman says this, you have to move beyond boycotts, 
we really have to build that capacity and not do it in a single uniform.